Thousands of couples have gotten their marriage off to a great start with the best-selling video series by Drs. Les and Leslie Parrott called Saving Your Marriage Before It Starts. For the first release of this series many years ago, Les and Leslie brought together several engaged and newly married couples for a weekend retreat. Now, Zondervan brings you the newest edition of this award-winning series, featuring Les and Leslie in front of a live studio audience, plus interviews with real-life couples. And for the first time, they checked back in with three of the couples featured in the original series over a decade ago. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. You know, we go to a lot of weddings, and uh, probably every week we get a wedding invitation, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. If you go to enough weddings, you know, people's personalities come through. You always see kind of something interesting you weren't quite expecting. We have a lot of wedding stories, right? Tons of creative, different kinds There's of weddings. There's one that stands out. This happened a number of years ago. Colonial Church, perfect Very place formal. for a wedding. But we knew right at the beginning it was going to be a little different because of this little ring bear. Probably three, four years old. Very cute. Little white shorts on. He had a little bow tie. And you know how they teach these little ones to do that wedding walk, right? And he was doing the wedding walk coming down that center aisle. And every few steps, as he's walking down the aisle, he would pause. He would look at the congregation and go, Rawr. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and he was growling at people as he came down that center aisle. Remember, it was crazy. It was crazy, but then he was a perfect gentleman the whole ceremony, yeah. and you kind of forgot about it. And he, he, didn't, he didn't growl again until kind of the recession, yes, right? Yes, on his way out, right. growled again. And, uh, <laughs> but then we got to the reception. Everybody was abuzz yeah. talking about how cute this was, but why was he growling and so forth. And uh, word started to spread. This little guy, three, four years old, he had the impression that he was to be the ring bear. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Doesn't that make sense? What's a ring bearer anyway, exactly. right, if you're three or four years old? Right. And Leslie and I, we left that experience. We said that is a perfect illustration for how our beliefs impact our behavior, totally right? True. It doesn't matter whether your beliefs are right or wrong. Your beliefs are still the fuel for what you do in this relationship. And that's why we feel like one of the most important questions we can ask right off the top is right. the question of have you faced the misbeliefs of marriage with honesty? The way I love you is through these things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's a, um, I guess that there could be some, because I put caring as 12, mm -hmm. <laughs> which there's 12 items. <laughs> so what do you guys think when you see this thing? Wow. 10 so. years ago. Yeah, we looked different. I didn't think we changed that much, but I guess we did. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Honestly, I'm going, gee, I could talk a pretty good game. Yeah, <laughs> I've been like, and I smiled and nodded, and mm -hmm, yeah, you're so smart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But it's, there's, a, there's this wild sensation of, I almost feel like, like today, we're getting started. Like, we are just learning what it means to be married. We were so young. I think it was different for me in the amount of times that we were, or that we have been disconnected from one another. Mm -hmm. I thought that we would be, you know, up on top of the mountain more often than we have been. I remember we used to talk a lot about the, what, what is the ideal home, the ideal job, that I would be home every day after work at 5.30, we would have dinner together. Um, and that was never an expectation of mine, but it certainly was of Julie's that I would be, that, that it would be, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of a life. Have you faced the misbeliefs of marriage with honesty? Absolutely, because the way we approach marriage is so shaped by the myths or misbeliefs that we bring with us into this relationship. And one of those is this myth that we expect the same things from married life. Right. In other words, the picture that you have in your mind's eye yes. of what um, marriage is supposed to be exactly like. Exactly. The ideal marriage that I want. I'm assuming that I have yes. the, you know, it's the same. And it's not. No. And we don't talk about it because we make that assumption. Yeah, you're just assuming that. And you don't even realize that you don't have those same expectations expectations until you get married and your spouse begins to live on a whole different plan. I was expecting someone more like my father and he was behaving more like his father. And they're two very, very different people. My expectations initially were that she would always be happy with me and I always want to be around me. I think we both had fairy tale expectations. The reality is that's not the case. I'm a lot more like my parents than I guess I realized. But I just thought that somehow when I was married things would be a little smooth and even the big stressors in life wouldn't stress me out that much. 
and it was just sort of a fairy tale. For example, my dad sometimes he um, would make sure us as kids, he would want us to make sure that things were in their rightful places, like our shoes in the closet. And I never really realized that I was like that. It's partly because we live by unspoken exactly. rules. Exactly. Everybody in here has their own little invisible rule book. Right. And you don't even know that you have rules about how life is supposed to be lived until you get married and that person you're living with begins to break your, your rules, rules, right? Exactly. And that's when we go, wait a second, that's not how yeah. life is a supposed to be. A great marriage doesn't look like this. We don't do it that way. You know, in fact, I can remember we'd only been married a few months, went home to my family for our first Christmas. We were going to share as a married couple. Now, I am so excited because I'm a new bride and I'm thinking, hey, I'm going to bring Les into all my special traditions. He'll get a taste for everything that's been meaningful to me in my childhood. So we fly home from graduate school, from LA to Chicago, and it's going to be the perfect like Christmas. A red eye special. Exactly. It's, uh, you know, so all what we could, we could afford. afford in grad school. So we get in the middle of the night, but I am, it doesn't matter to me. I'm so excited and the adrenaline's pumping. I'm telling him tomorrow morning's going to be the Christmas Eve breakfast. So I've described it all to him. We're crawling into bed and the next morning, like three and a half hours of sleep, I wake up, pop out of bed. I'm thrilled. You know, this is it. And I shake him, come on down, pull on my robe and slippers. And, you know, I go down and I just get wrapped up in it. The house smells right. The food's great. We circle around the table. And it's my family. We're laughing. And, I mean, we're just having a great time. Well, my mom, who's the host, you know, just loves to do that, have us all home. She's now poured my third cup of coffee. And it hits me, Les hasn't joined the table yet. Now, I said to everyone, just go ahead and get started. You know, it's casual. But he hasn't been there. And all of a sudden, in my heart, I just felt this heaviness. Like, he's missing this wonderful thing. So I, I excuse myself and I run up stairs thinking, well, he doesn't know you're supposed to come in your jammies. He probably got in the shower, but you guys know exactly where Les was when I got up there. Yes. Yeah. What I should be doing was sleeping because yeah. it, we got in really, we had like three hours of sleep, but you're yes, pumped full of adrenaline, so I, it didn't matter to you, it's right? It's the best thing in the world. Right. My family's Christmas Eve breakfast. So, so she shakes me yeah, awake. I did shake and it you awake. wasn't so wasn't gentle. a gentle yeah, little right. shake this time. <laughs> and, and I can't describe to you the emotions. I mean, it all of a sudden... I can't describe to you the emotions <laughs> that she was having. Exactly right. I, mean, I think my eyes started welling up. Oh, you. yeah, she's waking me up and she's shaking me and saying, where are you? Missed the breakfast. You knew this was important. Yes. I can't believe you've missed breakfast. And I'm waking up and I'm thinking, who is this woman? And where am I? And where's her medication? You know, I mean, it's just like, wow, all I did was miss a meal. And she's actually tearing up and saying, don't you love me? I was. I you doubted knew this, it. You knew this breakfast was important to me, yeah, right? Exactly. But uh, it just didn't dawn on me that it was that important. I don't even think you knew it was that important no, until I didn't show until up. Until you broke that you know, right. special thing. Right. And the reason I didn't know it was important, <laughs> the reason I didn't know it was important is because in my home, we didn't do it that way. In my home, we did it the right way. <laughs> in my home, we slept in, you yes, know, you it's did. the holidays, relax, we'll see you at lunch or dinner tomorrow, <laughs> you know, whatever works for you, right? That is exactly what your traditions are like. <laughs> right. Yeah. But that's what it's like, exactly. right? We get these yeah. from the homes that we grew right. up in, and those unspoken rules are powerful. Very powerful. Everybody has these unspoken rules. And uh, in fact, where do you think they come from? Where do you get these unspoken rules? They come from your home, right? Mm -hmm. That home you grew up in. That shapes you. Absolutely. Uh, quick example. I came home, two older brothers, Rich and Raj. Uh, of course, my dad, myself, and then mom. Mom's the only female in this family. Anybody have a similar home like that? Okay. I don't know if your mom was at all like mine. My mom decided, in spite of having all these men in the house, she was still going to raise us with a, a little bit of etiquette, okay? And I can give you dozens of examples of how she did this, but one stands out. Didn't matter how informal a meal was, hamburgers and hot dogs around the kitchen table, just the family, mom would never put a bottle of ketchup on the table. Any idea what she'd do with the ketchup? Yeah, she'd put a little dish, right? You'd spoon it out, okay? My pinky goes up whenever I think about it, right? <laughs> and I can remember saying, you know, as a kid, mom, just put the bottle of ketchup out on the table. It's just us. Oh, no, honey, this is the proper way. This is how we got to do it. And my brothers would chime in. Come on, just put it out there. No, 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 this is how we're going to do it. And, and everyone, my, my dad would sometimes try to help us out. Laura Lee, just put it out there for him. You know, no, this is how we're going to do it. I can remember saying as a kid, well, man, when I get my own house, I'm going to get my own bottle of ketchup, right? <laughs> I'll get five or six of them, just leave them all over the place, yeah. 
<laughs> and uh, eventually we got our own little house, right? We, did. we moved from Chicago to Los Angeles to go to graduate school, and uh, I bet we'd been married less than a week. And I'm in the kitchen trying to fix something nice, kind right. of have this fantasy of a little meal together. I came into the kitchen, and we're probably having hamburgers or hot dogs. Yeah. Right there in the middle of this table that Leslie had set was a big squeezable bottle, Heinz 57 ketchup. And how do you think I reacted? What in the world? You born in a barn? Huh? <laughs> you don't put a naked bottle of ketchup out on the table. You put a little dish, you spoon it out, right? Now, you understand I didn't want to be that way. My mom made me that way, right? Yes, she did. <laughs> <laughs> Just like your mom made you exactly. certain ways, right? Doesn't matter what kind of home you came from. That family of origin shapes these unspoken rules. Yeah, and it's rules. not just unspoken rules, right. but it's also this powerful thing we have, we would call your unconscious roles. I mean, we just know we're loved when we see these certain things that we've been programmed yeah. to kind so of expect. So, for example, Leslie grew up in a home where her dad would always open up her mom's door. And or, mine. or your door, yeah. right? Like a, the car door. Like they go to the grocery store, they would just sit in the car, and he would walk around and open up her door. Any guy do that all the time? Oh, Look really? Wow, that. I'm impressed. That's amazing. I'll check in with you in 10 years, see how you're doing. <laughs> uh, but I am, I'm impressed. That's great. I never saw I'm that impressed. modeled. I mean, no, uh, my whole not. life growing up, my dad never did that. He said, that's why we got power locks. Why would we take time doing that, you know? But, uh, but I remember the first couple dates, Leslie yeah. and I went on, you know, I'm halfway to the restaurant. I'm looking back, she's still in the car, you know, what, you know what's the deal? But it's those kinds of things. Exactly. You know your love when I do those kinds of things Absolutely. for you. Absolutely, and it can be anything. I mean, it could be how we celebrate birthdays or take right. care of the car or the home or whatever it is, but these are the things that you were programmed to feel loved when you saw them. Coming home at the end of the day, I would picture... Uh, dinner on the table. Well, no, no, not necessarily dinner on the table, but I would picture dinner to be soon. <laughs> My dad took his role as a husband and father as being the one who kind of fixes everything and takes care of the home and the cars. Who's going to take out the trash? Who you saw do it in your house? Would your mom do it or your dad do it? Mm -hmm. Who, who's going to do it in your marriage? And I find myself wanting John to be that kind of husband as well. This is what I saw my parents do. And thus, a lot of times, it was what we expected the other one would do. Mm -hmm. So to be in it and to see it, it, that was, boom, aha. That was an aha moment for me. It's the things that when you start to talk about them, things get tense, and so you quickly kind of go to your corners or ignore them or sweep them under the rug. And it's not that you're going to solve them in that first two years of marriage, but if you can at least get a discipline of saying, here's how we talk about those things and address them. Well, there you have it, the myths of marriage. What an important concept to study, and we hope you'll do just that with your workbooks. There's helpful exercises as well as questions in there. Yeah, and they'll just help you take it further and really discover your own unique unspoken rules, unconscious rules, and your own myths. There's another myth that's very powerful, and it's a myth that says everything good will get better. It's a powerful myth. Everything good, after I get married, everything good is just going to get better and better. And sure, a lot of good things do get better, that's true. but there's also some necessary losses when it comes to marriage. Joel and I are playful. We build forts. We run around. We do crafts. Oh, I shouldn't admit that. <laughs> I do crafts, and Joel supervises. you got to take it all in stride. Hmm that life does happen, you're not going to have the, the honeymoon 24-7. Some of the things that you can love so much about a person are the same ones, that, exact same ones that on the flip side drive you crazy. And I love Joel's playfulness, but sometimes it can come across as um, me feeling like I need to be like, okay, time to be serious. Often the very skills and traits and abilities that we are so attracted to and drawn to in our spouse have a dark side, you know? And if they're really patient, well, you end up waiting on them a long time and that kind of a thing. And you begin to experience that dark side and it can be a little bit of a jolt. Yeah, and marriage. that's why you sometimes hear people saying, I don't know what happened to her since we've been married. She's so different than when we were dating, right. you know? She, she used to like going to car shows. What happened, you know? Or whatever it is. And those, those necessary losses Absolutely. take place. Now, the reverse of that is also yeah. Yeah, powerful. exactly. It's almost the, the reverse side of that coin, and that's that everything bad will disappear once we get married. When we go to a movie and you're chewing on your ice, I can't, con I can't concentrate on the movie because you're chewing your ice. Well, that's nothing compared to uh, 
you eating off my plate. Well, I thought you'd like to share with me. Oh, no. <laughs> so, uh, what do you guys think of that? Well, he still chews his ice and it mugs still, me. You know, <laughs> so 10 years later, he's still That's, chewing his ice. Yes. But after 10 years, you realize that those things aren't as important and you learn to live with those and um, just deal with them. Everything bad will disappear. Just that, that sense of we're going to have the happily ever after. And we may be a little cynical about it in general, but we kind of believe in our heart of hearts. In my case, that's going to happen here. You know, right. just that, that it's just going to erase all the pain from my past because our love is that powerful. That marriage is going to just somehow magically kind of dispense with that. Yeah, and listen, the... marriage is a wonderful healing thing, but it doesn't erase all the pain in your life. You bring that into your marriage. It's part of your story, and over time, you kind of share that together. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, there's another myth that we've got to cover because this one, this next myth, this is this is really the myth yes, I think that is. causes most couples to stumble. I think it's and, really uh, deeply felt, but rarely articulated. Yeah, we don't talk about this yeah. myth very much, uh, but it is something deep within all of us, mm -hmm. and it's the myth that says my spouse should make me whole. Right. right? They should make up for all the stuff that I'm lacking. My spouse should just kind of somehow magic, and we should do that for each other. You should do Absolutely. that for me, and I should do that for you. And of course, that's unrealistic, and we know that kind of at a logical level, but deep down inside, we yeah. still kind of hold on to that, it's right? It's such a deep felt desire. It's almost a compulsion, really. Right, it really is. And, and uh, you know, we teach a class at our university, at Seattle Pacific University, mm -hmm. called Relationships 101. And in this class, we start off this 10-session this class with one sentence mm -hmm. that we say can revolutionize right. your relationship. In fact, we tell our students, if you can wrap your mind around the truth of this single sentence, it has the power to revolutionize not only your love life, but your relationship with mom and dad and friends and everything else. And it's the sentence that says this, if you try to build intimacy with another person before you have done the hard work of getting whole on your own, all your relationships become an attempt to complete yourself. And they'll fall flat, guaranteed. Why? Because nobody was designed to complete you. You can look high and low. You're not going to find anybody that has that in their own job description. It's as if I was promised something with marriage to her that she was going, going to fulfill every part of like what I felt that my life was lacking. I believe my wife not necessarily completes me because I think to say that someone else completes you is to say that you're missing something. That's where we have the most tension, I think, is how I continue to fail her expectations and vice versa. It was very ingrained in us that God completes us, not each other. That has helped me know that Joel doesn't complete me, but he certainly compliments me well, and I, I love that about him. Let me illustrate this real quick. Can I borrow you two, just for a split second? You didn't know I was going to do this. Come up here, just for a split second. Just stand right here. And uh, it, just, what are your names? Scott. Go ahead and turn around, Scott. Here you go, Les. And your name? Melissa. Melissa. All right. Just, you guys are embarrassed, aren't you? You didn't know I was doing this. Stand about a, stand about a foot apart, okay? And then uh, just look at the audience. And then just with your feet planted, just put your shoulders together. And then gently put your heads together. <laughs> now we see a couple like this, and what do we say? Aww. Aww. You're making a sick. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what Leslie and I call an A-frame relationship. An A-frame relationship. Why? Because you have two people that, at least figuratively, walk around like that A-frame. And what happens if one of them stumbles? You have two people figuratively walking around like this, and one of them stumbles. What happens? Yeah, the whole relationship gives way, right? Why? Because there's no individual identity. Exactly. There's no wholeness. Right? Absolutely. And it doesn't matter how hard you try to meet those needs, you absolutely can't do it. So it becomes a very demanding kind of a relationship. Right. right. Well, there's another relationship style. Yeah, and you know this from the book that we talk about not just the A-frame relationship, right. but uh, also the H-frame relationship. Exactly. And it's kind of the opposite strategy because here's a couple that doesn't really know how to be really dependent on each other. So they kind of are this H-frame. They're kind of connected but very distant from each other and it's the kind of couple you would really you would think of when he comes home from work maybe she says how was your day and, and they both walked in and he thinks for it's a minute just, it's just like they're on parallel tracks but they they don't interact right exactly, they don't intersect yeah. now the alternative to both of these is what we call the M frame relationship right. right and it's represented by a couple that's holding hands at least figuratively and as they walk down through life's road if uh, one of them stumbles the other person's strong enough to pick him up and keep going, right? That's right. It's very interdependent. But to say that someone 
helps you to be a better person and helps you to be the best that you can be. I think I completely have that in my life and I think it's the most uh, amazing and incredible thing because now I see it now at this point in the marriage more so than I saw it at the beginning of the marriage for sure. As iron sharpens iron, you help each other on the pathway of wholeness.